turn this overview of this chapter. I'm going to go back and, and at the beginning of this course and see how we've gotten here. So first, remember chapter 1, we talked about the Old Testament, how the Old Testament revealed that it was God's original plan, that as a means and part of redemption and salvation, the church was there, right, in his plan. Um, we saw after that how Christ established the church. After that, we continued on, we saw the, the history of the early church, and we saw what it looked like. Um, we continued on and saw how the church is seen as a sacrament of salvation, that is, it's the means in which grace is received, and also that the apostles and the church received from Christ a commission to govern, to teach, and to sanctify. So we looked at the governing body of the church, we looked at the church uh, authority as teacher and magisterium, and we looked at the church's role as bringing grace right, to the world, and what that means with the salvation, and no salvation outside of the church. Now, the last chapter, we talked about the four marks of the church, and that there are a lot of churches that are Christian that are different today, right? So if we want to find Christ's church, as opposed to just other people's Christian churches, we have to investigate. And we found that Christ's church has four unique marks. And those four marks are, that is one in teaching and faith and worship. It is uh, <clears throat> holy, it is apostolic, and it is universal, that is Catholic. So this chapter, we want to dive into the membership in the church. We want to get into, all right, now that we've talked about it, what do the members of the church do? Right? What's it all about? What does life look like as a member of the church? Since we talked about Christ's church, we talked about salvation, but when you join the church, what are you called to do? Right? What does it look like? How do we continue on? How do we get to heaven through the church? That's what this chapter is all about. So we'll talk about the role of the laity, the role of the priesthood. We'll talk about sacraments. And we'll talk about prayer, among other things. Let's put this chapter short and sweet as we can. The life of the faithful and the membership of the church. We are created by God to be in union with Him. We sinned and made an infinite rupture between us and God. We denied God's grace, which is what we need to satisfy our soul and our whole personhood. Christ dies on the cross and pours out His grace for us. Christ establishes a means and a way to encounter that grace. Christ says, Be baptized. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he does not have eternal life within him, aka grace. So grace is necessary to go back and meet with God. We say, I believe. And if we say, I believe, we should say, I'm going to do what you say. And so what does he say? Receive grace. How do we receive grace? We first baptism. But we also see there's the laying on of hands. There is the breaking of the bread. And there are other means, authority of forgiveness of sins, that are given to the church so that we can encounter that grace. So what does this chapter do? It talks about the sacraments as the means to, to receive the grace to get back into union with God and so have our salvation accomplished in our souls so that we may be where God desires us to be, in union with him forever. <laughs> Here's a word on the liturgy, okay? Uh, a few things about the liturgy. <clears throat> what the heck is it? Maybe we hear this word, liturgy. A lot of times we think of the Mass, the liturgy. We think they're interchangeable. They kind of are. Um, but here's the main thing to talk about when we, when we ask the question, what is the liturgy? Um, first, we, we look at ourselves. We look at Christianity. And we look at what Christians are called to. Right? And often, we get a hang-up and a difference between Catholics and non-Catholic Christians, right? When it comes to what's it all about. <clears throat> and it all comes down to a relationship with Christ, right? Um, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's a question that a lot of people ask, right? Um, that's it. Well, in the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church says, yes, there's a necessity for a personal relationship for Jesus Christ, but there is no individualized, personalized, isolated Christianity. That is, everyone who's called to be Christian is called to be in community, right? It's called to be uh, communally in Christianity, right? It's called the holiness in union with others, right? There's no, there's no, I'm going to go in my back corner and pray. Um, there's personal prayer, and, and each Christian's called to that, right? To speak to God and converse with God on their own. But there's also public prayer, public worship. We see in Acts chapter 2, which was the reading for this past Sunday, Easter Sunday, number 2, uh, and it was uh, about what did they do in the early church? Well, in Acts of the Apostles, they say, what do they do? They gather together for the breaking of the bread, for the, the teaching of the apostles, for the communal prayer, right? They gather together, 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 right? So personal individual prayers is, is key, but even more important in a sense is a recognition that we are one body, right? That there's communal worship, that we are called to worship together. There is no uh, Christianity without a unity of its people, right? So saying that, then we get the word liturgy. What does it come from? It comes from Greek work of the people, really public work, the people's work. That's what it's all about. Any task performed for the common good. That's what it comes from, right? Uh, so when you look at the Old Testament and the Greek translation of the Old Testament, when they use this word, liturgy, it's used right, by talking about when the whole people gather together, it's the worship led by the priest of the temple on behalf of all the people, right? So it's a, the public worship of God, so to speak. So what does that translate down to today, right? In the church, since the days of the very beginning of the church, uh, liturgy is when the church gathers together publicly as a community to offer worship to God, to pray together. Um, that worship includes mass, but it also includes all all the sacraments, right? Think of all the sacraments of the church. Um, you have uh, matrimony. It takes place in the church, right? It's communal. You have baptism, communal, right? In the church. You know, all the sacraments are in the community, and that's on purpose, right? That's why Catholicism doesn't have matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony, on a beach. It says it needs to be in a church. Why? Because that is the public worship. It's the public community. It's not an individual's matrimony in sacrament of marriage. No, you're getting married within the church community, right? Uh, very important. So what does liturgy mean in the church? Uh, plain and simply, the liturgy uh, is, is the public worship. Um, and so what does that, that mean? That means every time and that we gather together as a community to worship God, 
Um, we're celebrating the liturgy. So think of the sacraments, uh, the highest form of the liturgy, of course, when we think of the mass, right? When we gather together every Sunday or every day, right? To worship God together as a community and give him our praise and also give him, right? Uh, what we can offer, which is the sacrifice of Christ. That's the liturgy, plain and simply, nice and short, the public worship of the church, which has been going on from the very beginning. I also want to say a couple words on the one mediator. Um, this is one big uh, discussion point between Catholic and non-Catholic Christians as well, um, talking about the one mediator. The non-Catholic Christians want to say, and they say, uh, rightly, Jesus is the one mediator. But then, you know, the misunderstanding is a lot of non-Catholic Christians say, uh, Catholics say that the church is the mediator between God and man, or that there's some other mediator besides Christ, right? And God and, and scripture say that Christ is the one mediator. So what's the, what's the deal, right? What's, the, what's, the, what's that all about? Right? That's a big question. Um, so what does that mean? First of all, what is a mediator, right? A mediator is a go-between between two other people, right? He mediates. So you've got this party, you've got this party, and you've got the middle party, right? The go-between that helps unite the two, okay? So first of all, what do we have at the very beginning of creation, right? We have Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve are created, there's goodness all around, right? Before sin, they don't need a mediator, right? They're they are talking with God in the garden. All things are good, right? They're speaking with God directly. No need for mediator, right? But after they sin, right, they reject God. They're no longer in that communion with God. And so they need somebody, a go-between, uh, right, to bring them back together, to restore the relationship, right? So after sin, Adam and Eve and all of humanity needs a mediator, right, to restore the relationship, to bring us back together, right? The go-between, the one that brings God to us and the one that brings us to God, right? That's what a mediator is. That's a part to write down, highlight, underline, right? So what about Christ, right? What makes Christ the perfect mediator between God and man? Well, that one's awesome, right? Uh, what do we have? We have Christ who is who is God-man, right? Christ who is the one mediator by his very self, right? How, how, what else do we have uh, as a go-between uh, besides Christ? Uh, nothing, really. Christ is it, right? Because what do you have? Um, Christ brings God to man by becoming God incarnate, right? And Christ brings man to God by becoming God incarnate, right? So in Christ himself, you have the unity of God and man. He is the perfect mediator, right? He brings man and God together in his very flesh, in his very person. But he also does it, right, through his passion, death, and resurrection, right? By offering himself, by offering reparation, the infinite reparation of himself, and by pouring out his graces, which are eternal, for us to move to God, right? So Christ himself is the one mediator, the perfect mediator, the true mediator between God and man, right? Um, his entire life, passion, death, resurrection, ascension, everything, right, is what? It's an uninterrupted priestly action. What's that important? Think of a priest. What is a priest? The priest in the Old Testament, the priest in, in the most simple term, is, is one who mediates. The priest brings God to the people, and it brings the people to God, right? That's mediate, right? What does Christ do? He is the ultimate priest. He's the high priest. He's the eternal priest, right? Jesus is the one who offers sacrifice, priestly act, right, for the people to God. Uh, and brings God to the people. What's the sacrifice he offers? Himself, right? Okay, so <clears throat> so he's the priest. He's also the victim. Fantastic. He's the one mediator. He's it, right? So what does the church say about that? Well, the church says, you're right. That's it. That's the truth, right? That Jesus Christ is the one mediator, right? He is the dude, right? Uh, that's it. So what do you mean by that? What does that, what does that tell us? All right? In the liturgy of the church, what do we have, particularly in the Mass? Uh, Christ brings about the effects of salvation, right? Christ accomplishes the perfect worship of God. Right? What do we have in Mass? What do we have in the church? What do we have in the sacraments? What do we have in the liturgy, the people's worship? We gather together to what? To pray to God and to do what? To offer him the one sacrifice we can offer, Jesus Christ, right? To offer the Eucharist and to partake in the Eucharist. So what do we have in Mass? We have the people partaking in the sacrifice of the high priest Christ, Christ himself. And what do we have? The people participating in and eating the sacrifice of Christ himself. In the Mass, in the liturgy, right? In every sacrament. What do we have? In the sacraments, we have the people coming in contact with Christ and the graces he has won from the cross. And what does that mean? That means we have the people coming in contact with God. So what is the church's liturgy? What is the church? The church is the point where we meet God and where God comes to man. That's what the church is, right? So the church is the place where we encounter the one mediator, Jesus Christ. In the Mass, we encounter the Eucharist, God who comes to man and man who receives God. In the sacraments, baptism, we encounter the grace of the Holy Spirit, right? We encounter what Christ offers and we are brought into the body of Christ, right? In each and every sacrament, thus forth, we receive that grace. And so it is in the church that we receive the one mediator. So the Catholic Church would say, you're right, Christ is the one mediator. And the church, the body of Christ, is where we encounter that mediation.